Uh, I'm going to go ahead and begin. So welcome, everybody. I do encourage everyone to make sure that you are muted throughout the webinar, and then we will aim to have questions toward the end. Um, if you have questions, you are welcome to type them into chat, and then once we reach the end of the webinar, we I will start reading them, and Terry will answer them. Um, and then from there, I'll... Uh, I, here, I'll just do a quick introduction of myself. So my name is Brittany Like. I'm the program coordinator for Detroit Audubon, and I'm going to pass over the torch over to Terry. So uh, we're really happy to have him. Well, thank you. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I was uh, discussing with Brittany. Brittany, right? Did I get your name right? Okay, thank you. Um, that when I put this program together, I wasn't sure who in the world was going to be interested in hearing it, but I was going to try to tell my story to as many people as I could. Um, I, I, my name is Terry Grable, and I was a 30-year middle school educator in Fremont Middle School, and uh, I was raised where, right across the road from where I live. Um, does my arrow showing up on there? Okay, so Nuevo County is I think I probably need to move this uh, this crow because Nuevo County is about right there um, in an unfortunate position as far as a bird is flying. Um, I was uh, raised in the 60s and early 70s um, adoring birds and uh, my, my parents were very, very supportive through the whole um, thing, I think they would have uh, would have been easier for them if I was more into basketball or football or motorcycles, because back then we didn't have the internet and my parents didn't know anybody that looked at birds and and either did I. I thought I was I thought there was something weird about me, which may be true, but I remember when I was young looking through my Peterson Field Guide and uh, in the preface um Roger Tory Peterson describes you know keeping a list and also getting together with other birders to, to share the experience and I didn't know any other birders it was just uh, me wandering around my parents farm um and being in love with birds they, they nicknamed me Birdman when I was 10 years old and uh my earliest memories are, are of loving birds and it wasn't until I finally went to college at CMU, fire up chips. I, uh, I found other people that were interested in the same thing. And uh, so I was a young adult before I knew that there was a community of birders um, and they actually went out looking for birds rather than just noticing what birds were around them. So anyway, I, uh, I decided, um, let me back up a little bit. Um, in a, my classroom, I was a science teacher, and uh, I was bringing my love of birds into it. And in 2011, when the, the movie The Big Year was released, I started finding curriculum excuses to, to show The Big Year in class every year. And my kids were captivated by it. They, they thought it was kind of corny at first, but then they, they fell in love with it. And every year the kids were asking, Mr. Grable, when are you gonna do your big year? Without going into an explanation to them of a teacher's salary and how that might be a, a, an obstacle, I said, I'm probably never gonna do that because I'm not interested in chasing rare birds. <clears throat> and uh, it wasn't until about December of 2020 when I, I ran into is this going to call? I ran into this this man at uh, in Grand Rapids at Reed's Lake, and we were looking at a merlin and some water birds. And uh, his name is Jim Markham, and I've met Jim several times. And he's a he's a prominent birder in West Michigan. And he's told me I think my count my species count is going to be over three hundred this year for Michigan. Wow. That's, that's a lot for Michigan. And, uh, and it was on that boardwalk that I decided that I was gonna do a Michigan big year. I was gonna spend the next year 
trying to see as many species of birds as I could. Um, this is before I talked to my wife, Andrea. Um, Jim was the first one that I told. And I went home and talked to Andrea and bless her heart. She just said, okay, tell me how I can help. Um, I don't think either of us were prepared for how much time we were gonna spend apart in 2021. Um, this is Andrea here in the, in the picture on the left. She and I are uh, walking on, on a boardwalk on Beaver Island. It's our favorite place in the world. In fact, we bought a little piece of land up there a couple of years ago and we're gonna build a cabin there this summer. Andrea is my favorite birding buddy. She uh, wasn't a birder before we got married 12 years ago, um, but she, she's got better eyes and ears than I do. On the right is a young man who is 19 now. He's a, his name is Brennan Schuler, and Brennan started birding with me um, in, when he was in sixth grade. And I was happy to take him to Taos Point several times and on several birding trips because I felt it was important for someone with that interest to have a birding mentor. And I felt like that's something I wish I would have had when I was a kid was uh, someone that uh, was into the same thing I was and could point me into places where we could meet other birders. Anyway, you'll hear more about both of them as we go through this. Um, Brittany had said she saw, she uh, had seen this meme and I saw that it was posted on the uh, Detroit Audubon um, Facebook page. Uh, this one, it really hit home for me. Although if I were to do this differently, if I, if I had made this meme, I would have put weird duck time here in the top left because in, January of 2021, um, this is what was, this is the big deal was all these ducks that were around that aren't around during the spring, summer, and fall. Um, the scoters um, and uh, some eiders and this weird little red breasted merganser thing with a bad haircut. Um, and those of you, I'm, I'm, I'm probably tr preaching to the choir now. I had, um, been invited to talk to a local library and the talk has to go a little bit different when I'm talking to non-birders but those of us who are birders we we know that the the year is kind of divided into these four quadrants where um it's fast and furious through the ele elegant songbird spring they're singing like crazy all the migrants are starting to show up um, and then comes summer and no one none of the birds are saying anything they're still around, but they're not saying much. Um, one of the things I was surprised by was how different fall migration was from spring migration. Um, it's, a, it's, it's just a different kind of a, a journey for the birds and you end up with uh, some weird things, uh, maybe young of the year that are lost on their journey south and they end up in places that uh, they shouldn't be. Um, you got me nervous when you said Ken Kaufman's name a little while ago. I don't, <laughs> that would be intimidating to give a bird talk to Ken Kaufman. In any case, um, this, uh, the quote that I have on the right is, uh, um, I, I birded with Ken and Kimberly um, a few times at the biggest week in American birding. And one time oh, he and I were talking about uh, how to be a better birder. And uh, I found this really, um, affirming when he said, if you enjoy your birding, then you're already a good birder. And I, when I typed this on there, I thought I better give, shoot Ken a message on Facebook and get permission to use his quote. And he said, well, that's really a, that's a really wise quote, but I don't think it's mine. I said, well, um, I think it is. And he said, well, that's fine. Go ahead and take it and call it your own. So I, I put this on here. Um, the, the boy over here on the left uh, reminds me of a, a scene at Kensington, maybe, where the birds come right up to you begging for food. But uh, the, the caption, I think, is, is important. Um, you're doing it wrong. Um, I don't think you can. Well, I guess you can. I, I think most of us think that uh, um, 
you know, we, we bird a certain way. And uh, sometimes we're surprised when we meet birders who bird differently. Andrea and I were kind of serendipitous birders. We would go to a location and just see what kind of birds we could find. <clears throat> but undertaking a, a big year, I had to kind of change that paradigm and uh, realize that, um, I had to watch the rare bird reports and I was running to find individual species of birds instead of going to a location just to see what birds were, were about or, or around. So we started in January as uh, most years do. And uh, I'm gonna include along with my terrible photography, I'll put some other images on here just so you can see what the birds really look like. Uh, I don't claim to be a great birder. Please uh, forgive me if you came here looking for stories from a really accomplished birder or a really good bird photographer, you're in the wrong webinar. Um, I'm, I'm super excited that it, I, I finally got around to doing a big year um, when I was almost 60 years old and I just wanted to share the story because um, in addition to a goal of seeing as many birds as I could in 2021, I uh, made a secondary goal to make sure that I birded in all 83 counties of Michigan. Um, I knew that I controlled how many counties I birded in. I don't, I felt like I had a lot less control over how many species of birds I was gonna find. And, uh, and not being experienced at chasing rare birds, I had no inkling that I would be in the running for um, um, any sort of a, um, record or even the top 10 in the in the state. So, well, I guess I should have, well, the, the snowy owl we got on, uh, got on January 1st. I say we, because Andrew is with me through most of the early part of the year. Um, this is another meme that I, I found that I really like too, because um, we, Andrew and I um, enjoy bringing new birders into our hobby. And it's always interesting to watch um, when, when people who haven't been birding before look at um, those of us who bird a lot, often the cargo that we carry um, is mind boggling to them. Um, and, and, you know, you, we all know birders that walk around with several tens of thousands of dollars of optics strapped around their bodies. And uh, I, I, I this this person right here, um, I'm going to call her Tori because Tori Martell was a she worked with Andrea and she'd not been a birder, so we decided to take her out birding with us. She was a photographer; she'd not done any bird photography, and uh, and I imagine some of the look on her face was a little bit like this. Um, we took her to a field where we had seen one short-eared owl flying and uh, we took we took her down there the next day to see if we could find some more and this is actually Tori's um, first bird photo that she took for the year um, and it blew me away because uh, I'm not a skilled photographer and I could barely keep my binoculars on this bird and she got, came up with some really terrific shots while we were watching this short-eared owl um, that we were standing on a dirt road and it was cold it was like January 4th and uh, a car pulled up a little Subaru with two women in the front and a beagle and uh, the car slowed down and opened her window and she said you're Terry Grable. I said, yes, I am. And she introduced herself as Marie Rust. She uh, had seen some of my um, posts on Birding Michigan and on the Facebook page and also Nuevo County Birders. And uh, so she was familiar with me a little bit. And we talked for quite a while um, and she lives near us. I bring up her name because she plays an important part in this story several different times. I found out right away that uh, um, being still a full-time teacher during COVID, it made getting out and seeing birds during the week really, really hard. 
because uh, when the three o'clock bell rang, that meant I had about an hour and a half of light left and I can't get very far um, in an hour and a half. This bird, this uh, varied thrush popped up during the week while I was in front of class and my, my uh, alerts notification pinged and my students, as I told you, um, I kept them abreast of my my bird hunt, not bird hunting, that sounds terrible. My my search for the birds, and they knew when the chime went off, that meant that there was a rare bird and that Mr. Grable is probably going to be grumpy for a little while because I couldn't go and chase the rare bird. But I think this was the first Saturday in January of 2021, a very thrush popped up in, uh, in Manistee, which is a couple hours from home. And uh, so that first Saturday, I grabbed my uh, bag that, that Andrea had packed for me with some granola bars and toothbrush and toothpaste and a clean pair of underwear, and I took off. And uh, I thought, boy, this is this is weird that I'm almost 60 years old and I'm still all giddy like a like a school kid because I'm out here doing this uh, this thing, the big year. I got there, and uh, I wasn't the first person there, Tori Martell, the woman that we had introduced to birding just about a week ago, um, was there. And these are her photos. Mine, you can tell it's a varied thrush, but with Tori's, you can actually get some, some understanding of it. But this is my, my first real rare bird, um, probably a lost bird on his way back south and uh, took a wrong turn and uh, ended up in Manistee under somebody's feeder. This is Barrow's golden eye. This is not, I wrote Getty images here. This I, the reason I put this on here because uh, this is my um, Barrow's golden eye photo. Um, this is a cool one that uh, Brennan, the young, the young man that uh, I've been birding with since he was in sixth grade was along with me on this particular Saturday. And we went to Ludington to, to find this thing. And it was a, by a marina and there was just a little small chunk of open water. And I bet there was 200 common golden eyes um, swimming in circles in this little open piece of water. And then they took to the wing and flew past us over to another small section of open water. And Bren, Brennan says, oh, I think I spotted him as they flew by. I thought that's ridiculous, you did not. Well, sure enough, he did. And there it is, this was the, the one barrows in that flock of uh, commons. And it was about then that I started to realize that uh, having people with me was uh, gonna be a big deal because the more eyes, the more you're likely to see. And uh, Brennan's ears are younger than me and his eyes are too, and he spotted it. Um, this is a Muskegon, this is, I'm glad Beth is with us. Hi, Beth. Um, I did not know Beth at the time that this photo was taken, but I would have been standing uh, on shore at uh, the Pier Marquette Park, um, looking out at the lighthouse with some uh, other members of the Muskegon Nature Club. And they were, they were looking just to see what was out there, but also they said, there's a harlequin duck out there. Someone reported a harlequin duck and I thought, I said to them, well, why are we standing here then? Well, it was, it was a really, really cold day and uh, the waves were washing over the pier and they said, well, I don't know that the harlequin duck is worth dying for. So I decided it was and I, I went out there. This is me. This is a terrible picture because Andrea's in the in the truck taking this through the windshield, but this is me um, getting sprayed. My optics were completely covered with ice. I could, I could hardly see anything. Um, pants were frozen and so were my, so was my coat. I couldn't bend my arms and bend my legs, but we, I did, it was able to get a glimpse of this male harlequin duck bobbing in the waves out there. Um, I, Got him, I got the sighting, turned around and said, yeah, well, I, I lived through it. So now it's time to go back. Um, and I, I walked past this bundled up lady, totally unaware of who she was. That's Beth Miller um, from the Muskegon Nature Club. And we, we actually ran into her, each other several times during the course of the year. Um, I waddled back here, um, couldn't bend my arms, couldn't bend my legs. 
because they were literally covered in sheets of ice. Got back in the truck and um, another lady walked up to me, bundled up. Well, she was smarter than me. I just had jeans on, but she was all bundled up. And she says, that Harlequin duck out there? I said, yeah, it sure is. And it was Jill Hennemeyer, um, who I ran into several times later as well. And I said, you're welcome to it. I'm, I'm done. We went and found some coffee. I did not have any idea, not that I was going to run into things like ibises and strange um, herons and things like that as we were going through this. This is uh, at Shiawassee uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And um, this is another Saturday morning and I was on my own this time and uh, still thinking I'm Mr. Cool because I'm out running with the big boys chasing all the rare birds. And I uh, got about halfway across the state to to the near the wildlife refuge and I realized I had not packed any my winter boots or anything and uh, this is my first experience of a, a panic attack of oh gosh what do I do now so I called my security blanket I called Andrea and she talked me tucked me down off the ledge a little bit and uh, I said I don't have any boots what am I going to do I'm going to have frostbite she said just stop somewhere and buy some boot warmers Oh, all right. So I, I, I did. I got there. And uh, the last 10 minutes of uh, the rare bird chase, I found really anxiety filled every time. What if the bird isn't there? You know, and uh, what if I have to go searching and I don't know where, which direction to walk and all these what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. And I got to the parking lot anticipating that since there was an ibis there, there'd be a bunch of birders and they'd all say hey look it's right there well, I got into the parking lot and there's zero people uh, oh no what do I do so I got out got all bundled up got the all the optics and stuff over the shoulder and I set out toward the trail and before I even got to the trail I looked in the ditch and there was this bird just uh just standing there showing off for me this one uh, I, I counted as a glossy ibis um, but the Michigan um, Birds Record Committee um, eventually disqualified it as a glossy ibis and said it was an immature white-faced ibis, which was okay. I ended up finding a glossy ibis in Muskegon later in the year. This is a place I was unprepared for. Uh, this is Tuscornia Park in Berrien County. I didn't know that Berrien County was a terrific birding place. Um, but boy, is it. And uh, we, I went there several times on days like in the picture here where um, you know, wouldn't have dared walk very far out on the pier because I didn't want to become one with Lake Michigan. But there had been red-throated loons popping up, being reported on eBird there. So I got Brennan on a Saturday and we drove down to Tiscornia Park and searched and searched and searched for a red-throated loon bobbing in the water. Couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. And in one of, the, um, one of our trips down there, there was also a King Eider. And I, uh, I included a nice picture of King Eider. And this is what I imagined I was looking for when we got there. Um, what we saw was this, which is still a King Eider. It's just not the big, beautiful male. This is a young male. Um, this was a cool bird for several reasons. One is the life bird for me. And another was, it was a uh, species number 100 and it was still January. And I thought, wow, this is one month and a hundred species. That should mean equal about 1200 by the end of the year, according to my math. Um, <laughs> not really, I didn't think that, but it was exciting that this, this, this cool bird was, was species number 100. On one of my trips there, uh, I encountered, oh, there it is, number 100. I encountered this group. Um, I, I was out on the pier looking for that red-throated loon again. And uh, this group came up and all dressed relatively the same. They all wore flip-flops. The women would not make eye contact with me, which was probably good advice for, you know, strange people in binoculars standing out on a pier. 
Um, eventually, I ran into a, a man that was with them, and uh, he described what they were doing. They were just there sightseeing. From they're from Marshall, Michigan, and they um, occupied uh, a spiritual commune there. And then they invited me over to become, you know, to become familiar with their group. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be wonderful if I had to write Andrea a letter saying that I hooked up with a commune and she should come down. I didn't go to dinner with them. I did eventually find this red-throated loon. And uh, I figured out why I couldn't find it before. I was looking for red-throated loons bobbing in the waves. And in reality, it was red-throated loons flying at quite a distance. This one, I, uh, I want to make sure I included this one because I, I went to Central Michigan University in Mount Pleasant, which is part of Isabella County. And this is the first Isabella County birding I had done since college. Um, Andrew and I got home from um, church one Sunday and the rare bird popped up that there was five species of birds in this one pond in a field west of Mount Pleasant. So I grabbed the bag with the granola bars and my other goodies and took off. Um, got almost there and the anxiety set in and I, oh, what if I miss them? What if I miss them? I'm on the phone with Andrea. As I pull, turn the corner, the field is literally full of Canada geese, as far as you could see. And uh, right in front was uh, this pair, the giant snow goose and what looks like a tiny snow goose. I thought, this is a Ross's goose. This is my, my life Ross's goose right there. And it was right out in front and there was one of them in the whole flock. Um, on the right hand side was a bird that I had mistakenly ID'd several times before, um, before this picture. These are cat cackling geese in the front. And um, Brendan and I several times looking in flocks of Canada geese were looking for just small Canada geese. And I sent in the rare bird report that I found cackling geese. And several times I got an email back from the, the reviewer, um, most often Adam Byrne, giving me some instruction that cackling geese were not just small Canada geese. They're definitely um, shaped differently, uh, little stubby bills, a round head, short neck, and there was about 12 of them moving around through the flock of Canada geese. So this was, this was a, a cool um, field, and it was right about this time that um, I found something on eBird that many days I wish I hadn't found. And you might, maybe you all know this, but on eBird, you can, there's a list, an up, a daily uploaded, loaded, uh, sorry, updated list of the top 100 birders in your area. So I looked and uh, this guy who'd never chased birds before at the end of January was in the top 20. I thought, wow, I wonder how many of us there are. And it said that there were 26,000 Michigan e-birders and I was in the top 20. I thought, wait, wow, I don't know how this can be because I'm only birding weekends. Um, and uh, so I screenshot the list and I sent it to my, all five of my kids who are my biggest cheerleaders. And uh, my middle son, Dusty, who is the most competitive person I know, his only comment was, wow, well, what's your goal? I, well, my goal is to see as many birds as I can and many species that I can, as I can. He said, that's not a goal, Dad. What number are you shooting for? A better question, Dad, is what's the record? <laughs> Get out of here. What are you talking about? What's the record? So I went online and did a Google search for the Michigan big year record. And uh, they came up with this guy. Maybe some of you um, are familiar with Adam. Um, I didn't recognize him when I finally met him at the end of 2021. He had long hair then. Um, but in any case, Adam's record in 2005 was 329 species. Uh, holy smokes, that's a lot. Um, but I'm already at over 100 and it's only January. 
watch out, Adam Byrne, here I come. Well, I, I also look at this, the year that he did this, this is before eBird and this is before smartphones. How in the world did this guy find this many birds? He's, so I, I printed out the article and I taped it to the file cabinet next to my desk and uh, in big, big red marks, I circled 329 because, well, Dusty challenged me, my son, and uh, and if you're gonna if you're gonna try to win, you got to try to win, I guess. Um, it, this one was taken not by me. This is Tori Martell's photo again. Anyway, it's a, a little blue hair, and I had no idea that these things popped up around the, especially in the Lower Peninsula. Um, this one popped up in Muskegon. This was one of the first birds that I was able to chase after school during the week. So the, the, the afternoon bell rings at three o'clock. So I uh, had been watching the rare bird reports and uh, there it was, and I had no idea how long it would stay. So I left it, I, I had my truck running and left at three o'clock. I got over there um, and this was one of the first times I got to a site and there were other birders there, which was a good feeling. Oh, there are, other birders here. I'm not just the only one. And they were all looking in the same direction, um, which was a good sign. And we got him pretty easily. This was another one that um, just past uh, the, the spring equinox, I had a couple hours of daylight after the three o'clock bell. And uh, I had just about enough time to uh, jump in the car and drive to Jackson, which is about two and a half hours from here. I got there just before dark and uh, on Birding, Michigan, I had been criticizing some of the people taking these pictures of long-eared owl in Jackson because it looked like they were ridiculously close to this bird. And I was suggesting that they were probably traumatizing the bird. Um, and they assured me that you you just walk along and there it is it just is right next to you and I thought that was crazy so I pulled into the parking lot of this uh baseball field and uh the rare bird report says just walk down the sidewalk there's uh three evergreen trees down there and the bird just camps out in those evergreen trees so I was walking down the sidewalk it went right under the trees and I looked up and and I, I snapped this picture the bird was probably six feet from me uh, I snapped a couple good pictures and, and walked on and drove home in the dark. I celebrated by uh, going to Panda Express and uh, realized that's not a good meal to eat while you're driving. Hamburgers are easier. Panda Express is messy. And uh, we had rice all over the car for a week. This is a, another bird I had time to chase after school on a weekday. Um, you can see that it's not winter there. This is in, oh, this is probably late April. Um, Jim Markham had found Royal Turn. And uh, it's another instance where I drove up to the site, had no idea what I was getting into. I'd never been to this uh, site before. Um, walked around the corner and I bet there were 30 birders and all their scopes were pointed in the same direction, which this is an incredible feeling. And I uh, was able to get this uh, a brief picture of this uh, royal turn. And it was just about now, uh, then, that I looked on the um, Michigan top 100 birders and I was in the top five. I thought, this is, this is crazy um, because I'm not supposed to be in the top five of anything in birding. I, I knew that there were people out there that were 10 times better birders than me. Some of them had uh, COVID jobs where they could work remotely and they could be wherever they wanted to be. I was standing in front of a classroom most of the time and still found myself in the top five. Of course, I hadn't seen Andrea for more than a few minutes a day since the beginning of the, of the year. This is a... Uh, this is one of my most frustrating slides because um, there had been a, a scissor, tail, scissor tail flycatcher that had been seen, been watched a lot in, um, in Grand Marais, right at the south shore of Lake 
Superior, middle of the UP, um, right on the Lake Superior shore by pictured rocks. And uh, it was during the week that this rare bird report kept popping up. Students, they would, the, my phone would chime and the kids all looked at me and said, you're gonna go look at that, right? So I kept going over there and I kept saying, it's that same darn flycatcher. But uh, boy, there weren't substitute teachers to be found during COVID. And uh, getting the time off, I guess I could have just called in sick, but I didn't. And uh, finally I gave in, I took a Friday off and I drove up after school on Thursday. Um, and I was scheduled to get to Grand Marais before dark. And people were seeing this bird that Thursday evening, right up until dark. I thought, this is gonna be a slam dunk. I've never seen a scissor tailed flycatcher before, and I'm gonna get one in the middle of the UP. And I got there, and it happened to be after dark. So I got a room and got up at daybreak the next day, looked around Grand Marais, up and down the peninsula for hours and couldn't find it. Um, ran into another, a young birder. He was probably in his early 20s. Um, his name was Oliver and he and I birded in Grand Marais together and we still couldn't find this darn bird. And it was about noon and I said, all right, I'm going to go take a drive west and go pick up some boreal species in the um, southwest of Marquette. As long as I was in the neighborhood, two and a half hours more wouldn't make any difference. So I got there, drove on the worst road I'd ever been on, the Pashiki grade. If you, any of you have been there, you can probably attest to the fact that it's miserable roads. I was able to get my boreal species. I had a Canada jay, a boreal chickadee, and the blackback woodpecker. Drove back to Grand Marais and ran into a, a friend of mine by the name of uh, Elliot Nelson. He's a native youper, and he was up there and he and I birded looking for this uh, scissor tail flycatcher for a couple more hours until it was dark and we still couldn't find it. And shortly before Elliot and I parted ways, he uh, said to me, yeah, I know that guy that you were birding with this morning, Oliver, his last name is Q, Oliver Q, he broke Adam's um, big year record last year. I thought, wait a second, Adam's record was my goal. What am I shooting for now? He said, I don't know, but uh, it was bigger than Adam's record. So Oliver Q, um, uh, in a COVID year, I think he worked remotely from his car, um, broke that record and uh, actually reset the record instead of 329, reset the record at 335. Oh my goodness. This is not helping. This is, a, this is something that I was talking to uh, some of the early um, joiners. This is Tawas Point. Um, this is uh, the city of East Tawas here. And around the, around the bend here is uh, Tawas Point, Tawas State Park. And there's campground. And there's this, uh, a nice trail that leads down to the end of the point. And uh, if, I guess if I were to pick one place in Michigan where um, where warbler viewing is uh, the most exciting, it would be Tawas Point in the middle of May. It's kind of a warbler trap, and there's birders everywhere. And I just I love people to begin with, and uh, birding people are my favorite people in the whole world. And we Andrea and I birded Tawas Point. We were walking back uh, back toward our vehicle and uh, came upon this group of people huddled around a birder. And I thought, well, I wonder who's holding court here. Maybe it's somebody, you know, a big deal birder. Maybe Ken Kaufman's out there for Pete's sake. Um, and I walked up and uh, who was it they were all listening to? Well, it was Marie Rust, the woman that I had run into in early January. And uh, at that point, Marie was, was quickly, catching up to me in the top 100 birders. She told me, you inspired me to do a big year, Terry. I thought, oh, great, me and my big mouth. Um, it, it made me think of the movie, The Big Year, where no one wanted to admit that they were doing a big year to avoid the competition. And I thought, oh, me and my big mouth. So Andrew and I walked on and um, 
a man ran up behind and say, you're Terry Grable. I, it was surreal to me that, that people knew who I was. He said, he said, I've been following you on eBird. And, uh, and I was just talking to Marie and she's, and he, he asked, had asked her uh, if, if she knew me. And she said, well, yeah, he's right up there in front of us if you want to talk to him. So he did. And I said, yeah, that Marie, she's making my life tough right now. And he said, uh, that's by design. She is trying to make it tough for you because she's trying to beat you. I thought, oh, oh boy, here we go. So I decided right then and there that uh, sometimes I need something like a kick in the butt to motivate myself. And you may remember from the movie, The Big Year, whenever they got frustrated, they shook their head and said, Bostic. Well, in my house, I shook my head and said, oh, that Marie Rust. I had to villainize someone. So um, I chose Marie as my, uh, my motivator. And uh, I realized every time I wasn't out looking for more birds to add to my list, Marie was. And, uh, and I decided right then and there, if I didn't win the big year race in 2021, I wasn't going to come in second to Marie. So anyway, um, in 2021 was the first time, well, every year I have this poster of the Warblers in Michigan um, in the office um, on the wall right over there. And uh, I, I cross them off as I see them with a dry erase marker every spring. Um, this was the first year in 2021 that Andrea and I were able to check off all of the warbler species from Michigan, um, including this uh, one down here, this oddball, the, uh, the Kentucky warbler that doesn't even appear on the Michigan warbler chart. This is a little closer to your neighborhood, I think. I wasn't prepared for how much time I was going to spend in the Southwest in Berrien County. I knew, however, that I was going to be spending a lot of time south of Detroit. Um, I looked at the, the maps of Point Mooley. I'd never been there before. And uh, it looked like a nice park that you could drive around and bird pretty easily. I was totally unprepared for Point Mooley. Um, it's, it, it's massive. It goes forever. And it's hard to bird. I mean, if <laughs> now for our first trip there, I took Brennan, the, the young man that was, uh, he was still a high schooler at the time. And uh, I didn't think that when I picked him up, I would have to remind him to bring weather appropriate clothing. I'm a school teacher, I should have known that. But uh, we got there and it was, a, it was a rainy, cold day, still early in the year. And we walked forever. This is a picture of Point Mule. Um, and it's a, it's a human made reef out into Lake Erie. And this structure, this curved structure out here is called, is, they refer to it as the ban banana. And there was uh, uh, white pelicans that were reported out there. And we did not have white pelicans on the year list. So we were able to get those. Um, and we, we went back to the car in the rain. Of course, Brennan had my raincoat on because he didn't have one. And I was frozen to the bone again. On the yeah, oh, I shouldn't have popped this one first. After we got off the uh, out of Point Bully, we went and warmed up with some hot chocolate, and we thought, well, we might as well do some more birding while we're out. And we went to uh, whatever county is directly west of Monroe County. I can't even remember what it is, uh, near Tecumseh. And uh, Brendan had seen a report of northern mockingbirds down there, and I thought, well, as long as we're here, let's go find them. And we Slenoway drove and county. drove. Lenaway? I think okay. so. Yeah. I, uh, I, 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 I don't know why. I, those ones will cross the south border. I, I mix up. Um, but we uh, were following the navigation and it took us to a residence. I thought it was a park. And the, at the end of the driveway was a, a sign just like this. And out here on the west side of the state, um, we know that people take that pretty seriously. Um, so I turned to Brennan and I said, maybe you should get out and go see if you can find that bird. He said, no way. Um, I know what in the, in the west side of the state, uh, there are people that take this awfully seriously. So we 
we decided that we probably didn't need to get out of the car. We might find Mockingbird somewhere else. And as we put it in reverse, we looked up the driveway and two Northern Mockingbirds flew across in front of us. So we call that a, a victory. Oh, that's big and orange. Oh, um, my third trip to Paimule, I had this view off to the west, a storm approaching. Um, I was by myself, so I called Andrea to talk me down off the ledge. And I said, I am the highest point out here. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. I'm, I'm at least a 20 minute run back to back to the car. I'm not sure how we're gonna do this. She said, it'll be fine. I said, thinking, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm saved. I might as well, you know, tempt fate. Um, and uh, I got out to the banana and there had been um, ibises recorded out there. I thought, I'm gonna see if I can find um, a white-faced ibis for sure. And uh, I, was, I got out to the end by the banana I looked off to the left and I saw this flash of purplish black. And I, I included my picture with this because and even though it's a terrible picture, um, I want you to recognize that it was taking in a torrential downpour. And uh, I was able to get this guy and you can actually see the white face on this ibis. He was with a glossy ibis, so that helped. Um, there we go, let's get rid of him. Um, this is a, a tricolored hair and this is my photograph. I include this so you can really tell what they look like. This was at Nanquing um, um, Wildlife Area, um, north, of, north of Bay City. And we walked and walked and walked to find, find this bird. When we first arrived there, um, we saw a big cluster of birders on this uh, observation tower. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be great. This is gonna be another slam dunk. We got close to them. And I noticed that they were all looking in different directions, which led me to the conclusion that, no, this isn't gonna be easy. But Andrea said, she was with me that time. She said, let's go find this thing. And sure enough, we were able to find it after, I bet we walked five miles along the lake here on shore and uh, finally found it. I gotta start going faster. Andrea's uh, main um, criticism of me is that I get wordy. I included this not because I hope my sound is enough. I meant to mute this. It was taken in the wind. I thought it was a great, great video. I, I actually took this video, uh, digiscope this eagle eating this uh, herring gull. And uh, I, I put it on here because a lot of the people that I taught with assumed that I was running around the state going to these pristine wilderness areas to see these things. This one was taken um, at Muskegon uh, Wastewater Facility. And this is a Muskegon wastewater from the air. Um, if, I, if I turned from when I, where I videoed this eagle, um, there was this, two giant lakes of poo. And uh, it, it, it smells bad and, it, and it's not that pretty, but boy, is there a lot of birds in the Muskegon wastewater. And fortunately for us, it's only a 20 minute drive from our house. Um, this is uh, getting at the very beginning of summer. And uh, there was a, a black bellied whistling duck um, near Bay City. I keep getting a, a, a prompt up here that my internet connection is unstable. Am I still coming through okay? It's okay? All right. Yeah. Um, this is a black belly whistling duck. I was the first one at this site that day. And uh, I was looking frantically to find this duck. And uh, this man on the right pulled up and got out. And he said, I, I think I have it over here. So we, I walked over by him. And we found this, uh, this duck. And he said, wait, <clears throat> I think you're Terry Grable. I said, yes, I am. He said, you're number one right now. I said, yeah, for the time being, maybe, because that was, that was the first week that I had, I made it through spring migration and, uh, and I was in the number one spot. And now I had the whole summer off. And I, I was just imagining that I was just gonna tear it up and I was gonna really distance myself from the pack. I was unprepared for how quiet the birds got um, 
in summer. This is uh, Robert Lachey, and he and I birded together um, I, I, at least 10 times together. We ran into each other and birded together um, uh, several times during the year. While I was over there um, in north of Bay City, I thought, well, as long as I'm in the neighborhood, let's go down to Macomb County. And uh, there's this neotropic cormorant that's been see seen there and it's nesting. So I drove up to the site and I looked across the water at St. Clair um, Metro Park and I bet there was 500 nesting cormorants and somewhere in there is one of these things. And I, I ate my lunch and scoped that whole thing and finally able to find it. This is my neotropic cormorant right here. This is not my image, but you can see that it's shaped differently than our um, double crested cormorants. It's um, narrower in the body with a longer proportionally tail. This, uh, this is in the heat of the summer now, and this is near Ann Arbor. Mississippi kite popped up, and uh, I'd never been to this park either. I drove up there, and uh, there was an older couple walking out of the trails, and I said, this must be the place, and they said to me, this is the first time someone said this, and my heart sank. They said, well, it was up until 20 minutes ago. Uh, oh, no. So I grabbed all my gear, and I started running through these trails, not knowing where I was going to try to find this Mississippi kite. Finally got to the, the signpost where it was sighted, and sure enough, we got, I got, um, got to see the Mississippi kite, and it was feasting on something that was making an incredible noise through the whole park, and maybe you remember that last year was uh, the, the hatch of this. This is the uh, um, periodic cicada hatch, and it only went up into Michigan, up into uh, Washtenaw County, and I was able to um, hear it, and these things were littering the ground and dropping from the air, and this guy was up here feasting on them. Um, here we are on Beaver Island. I told you this is an important place to me. I uh, always, I would take a group of my students up to CMU's biological station on Beaver Island, um, ever since 1999. And uh, so this is an important place to me. And while we were there, this lady said, I have a rough grouse that has befriended me. And I thought, that's crazy. So we went over to her cabin and sure enough, Theo um, would, would roost on her knee and on her shoulder. And I thought, that's, I've never seen anything like that. This year in 2022, we went back and sure enough, Theo was still following Vic through the woods. Um, I have a friend in Florida who does not have rough grouse on his life list. And every time he's been up here, I haven't been able to find one for him. And, uh, and we were able to almost pet one. I included this video without sound because all you can hear is red winged blackbirds, but I'd never seen an American bittern calling before. Um, and this is on Beaver Island as well. And while he's doing this, maybe you can imagine him making that little sound. Um, because they literally are just gulping air to make that sound. And I don't know if that's interesting or not, but I'd never seen it happen. Okay. Um, this is uh, Michigan's rarest warbler, but if you go to their habitat, they're all over the place. And this is near um, Grayling, Kirtland's warbler. I ran into a, um, a man that lives near me named uh, Charles Chandler there, and he and I are working on putting together a Michigan birding trail, uh, Michigan, a Nuego County birding trail uh, together. So maybe you guys can help them go birding in my neighborhood next year. I'm going back to Point Muley. So I love Point Muley, but man, I hate Point Muley. Every time I go there, it's a, it's a disaster, but I always get good birds. There was a laughing gull. One of them was sighted out here. Um, so I dropped Andrea off at her office in Lansing, and I thought as long as I'm in the neighborhood, I might as well go down to Monroe County. And uh, it was the, one of the first 90 degree days of 2021. And I'm hearing all the, the baggage and the luggage and the snacks and water and all my optics and I got out here to this mud flat and all the gulls look like this they're all gaping and uh, the gooler flood going on to thermal regulate and I was able to pick out the laughing gull in there um, through the sweat running down my face um, and I got got done with the bird and I turned and I 
couldn't figure out which way was my car. And every direction I looked, this is all you could see for as far as you could see. Um, to make a long story short, I did not die out there. I thought I was gonna, they're gonna find me curled, uh, shriveled up like a raisin, but Andrea is able to actually see me on Life 360 and directed me out because I couldn't find where I was going. Um, this is a cattle egret. I'm gonna go a little faster. This is a, another another uh, day where I ran into Robert Lachey and at the at the um, Bay Bay City State Park, and uh, this is the only cattle egret that I think was reported in, in that year. This one I've included because it's close to home, and this is the first I'm not a rare bird, but really weird bird that Tori Martell found on her own. The birder that we we set her on the on the path of the slippery slope. She said, "There's a least better in at the um, North Muskegon Nature um, Preserve." So I went there, and sure enough, he was. I did get better at photography as the year went on. This is actually my photo. Um, <laughs> this one, I, I I know people that are at all stages of this. This is basically where I started the year. Um, I got to here um, once in a while, down on one knee. Not not so much over here yet, um, and I I but being a good bird photographer is not one of my life dreams anyway. Um, this is another fellow that I spent a lot of time birding with. I I met him in the field um, looking for a a uh, black vulture, and uh, he and I became friends. We uh, had similar hairstyles. Um, I would suspect we we're about the same age, both uh, both Christian men, family men. So we. We kind of hit it off and we birded a lot of places together. This is um, the one of the last places I ran into him. This is in downtown Kalamazoo in somebody's backyard. These people that found this bird were not birders, but they knew they found out that birders wanted to come. So they set up a gallery and they actually um, gave us a lemonade and set up a viewing gallery so we could see um, this bird, which is, uh, is super common in the Southwest, but not so much in Michigan. Well, my videos are going pretty slow. This is a white winged dove. And uh, he sat pretty still for me too. Let's see if I can get my slide to go forward. There we go. You probably remember, a lot of you probably remember hearing about this bird or maybe you went to see it. I was, uh, one of the things I realized was that rare birds are not popping up equally in all 83 counties. So there was several counties that I had not birded in because I was, so focused on the rare birds. And this is a uh, following my trip through the thumb. I'd never birded in, in the Michigan's thumb area. I was on my way back west, just north of, I think I was just west of Lansing on I-96. And this thing, this rare bird report popped up that Michigan has been on the road. This is going to be great. At about that time, Andrea called me, my wife, and she said, our daughter had uh, had an accident in the horse barn at summer camp and had concussed herself. And I said, but there's a spoonbill out here. And she said, yeah, I know. I get it. So I don't know. It was a parenthood, rare bird. I chose parenthood and went home. We, we, got, we got Caitlin taken care of and Andrea and I got up before first light, drove down to Washtenaw County and uh, were able to get this bird at, at first light. The one on the left, um, I think by now you've seen the pattern. The one on the left is my photograph. This is a photo taken by my friend, Jen Sawa, also from the Wago County. And this was cool because this is bird number three, species number 300 for me and it's only July. Uh, oh man, this is going so well. Because um, once fall migration hits, it's going to be bonkers. Um, this is another summer bird. This one was seen flying north uh, through Berrien County, and then it wasn't seen again until my friend Ryan Allen located near Ludington. And I um, Andrea and I were at her parents having dinner. I had left my phone in the car because I wanted to be present with them and uh, didn't see the rare bird report until we got home. And it was, uh, it's about an hour and a half drive to Ludington from our house. And it was about 
hour and a half from the light and uh, sure enough I got there at first light was able to capture the wood stork um, and got back in time for Sunday morning service. I was not prepared for how often I was going to see this bridge. I knew there was a lot of birds at uh, at Whitefish Point, um, and a friend had told me you're going to spend a lot of time on the the Lake Superior Beach if you're going to do a big year. I didn't know what he was talking about, but what he was talking about was oh here's here's where um, Whitefish Point is if you're not familiar with it. Um, it's an incredible place to bird. This is uh, on the shore of Lake Superior, and this is the water bird counter shack. And there's a, the employee, um, a person that stands in the shack or by the shack from dawn till dusk, essentially, and counts every bird that goes by. And uh, we sit out there and we're able to pick up uh, um, Jaegers and all sorts of strange ducks and gulls and things like that. Um, during the months of October, especially in September, um, this was at home. I, I stayed there. There's not a hotel, so I slept in my car most of the time until it got too cramped, and I um, decided to, to pull a trailer up there, and I'll show you a picture of the trailer in a minute. Um, this fence, this barrier wasn't there at the beginning of the, the year. This barrier was put up after I went home one week, one Sunday and tested positive for COVID, that they put this fence up to keep people socially distanced out on the beach. I was not the most popular person in the world after I had walked out there um, carrying COVID with me. This is my, uh, <clears throat> my high tech camper. This, uh, this box trailer we used to chickens and goats in um, just a box a plywood box but it's eight feet long and I could put an inflatable mattress in it so I did that and I parked in the uh, parking lot at Whitefish Point um, every weekend and I slept in that and I had a little gas uh, lantern and a, a gas heater and all sorts of things once Andrea figured out that I was sleeping in a box with no ventilation she made me uh, she talked me into um, getting a window to put in the back. Actually, I took this window off a dead mo um, travel trailer in my neighbor's yard. Um, still haven't told the neighbor about it, but I didn't suffocate. Um, the weekend that I um, realized that I had COVID, I was sleeping in here and uh, it was just about dusk and bam, 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 someone was knocking at the back. I opened it up and it was a young man that I met earlier by the name of Nolan Keys. Um, he said, Are you a birder? I'm thinking to myself, this, what a crazy question. I'm sleeping and I just saw an ash-throated flycatcher. Well, that's crazy. That would be the second ash-throated flycatcher of the season for Whitefish Point. But sure enough, the next morning we went out there and uh, this is what I was greeted to when I uh, when we first went out there. This is a daybreak ash-throated flycatcher um, found by Nolan Keyes. Jumped back in the truck, drove home. Um, did test, I did test positive for COVID when I got home. It took a few days off from school. Good thing was uh, you can socially distance while you're birding. So I drove, uh, I was able to pick up a few more species, the Rufus uh, hummingbird and uh, a little gull while I was uh, in, I was in the quarantine protocol. We're getting awful close to the end here. So those of you who are anxious to be done, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm giving the abbreviated version, whether you believe it or not. Um, these, I, I, I fell in love with pine grosbeaks, beaks, um, waiting for other birds to come up at Whitefish Point. Um, they're just so photogenic and uh, such weird proportions. They look like a big purple finch with this little parrot-like bill. Um, and this was the one I think the female is every bit as pretty, if not prettier than the male of the species. I think, you know, a lot of birds, the males steal the show, but I think the subtle colors of the pine grosbeak female is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, just south of Whitefish Point um, near Paradise, there's a place where all my friends were getting great views and videos of 
up close videos of spruce grouse. And I tried every time I went up there, um, couldn't find them, couldn't find them, couldn't find them. And this was finally my, actually my last weekend up at Whitefish Point. And uh, this is actually my photograph as well. And surprisingly, the bird is in focus and this is a male spruce grouse. Um, <clears throat> was able to get all three species of Michigan grouse in one day actually up there um, in Chippewa County. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, okay. This is uh, in November at the Muskegon Wastewater. There was a red phalarope showed up and I hadn't had that. So this was uh, after school. I left at three, grabbed Andrew and we took off to Muskegon and uh, I heard people shouting my name and I was going out there and I first of all worried that it was people that were uh, intended harm to me but it was uh Robert Lachey again who had birded with several times and Marie Rust and at that point this is a this is the middle of November and on the top 100 I was in the first position Marie was in position number two and Robert was in position three and as many times as the three of us birded together as pairs, this is the only time during 2021 that all three of us were in the same place at the same time. So this is a treasured photo for me because uh, um, these people meant a lot to me. And I, and I know I say I vilified Marie, but uh, Marie and I are, are good friends and I, and, I, and I only do it in jest. Um, I, I thought this is kind of neat because a lot of the people we were birding against, I don't like using that word against, but that were competitors, were people a lot younger than us. Um, and uh, I was the only one that was still employed full time, um, that we saw each other a lot. And it was kind of cool because this is the first time we were able to be all in the same place at the same time. Um, another late um, November bird I got was this Townsend Solitaire at Warren Dunes in uh, Berrien County. This is another life bird for me. I added a, almost 80 new life birds to my life list um, on this run. This is Townsend Solitaire. I walked out there with a lady that I met in the parking lot. She was actually a former ornithology professor who had never been out looking for rare birds before. And she and I walked out there. And this bird was just so photogenic and uh, we got some great photos and videos of it. Um, and then, then comes December and I'm waiting for all the rare birds to pop up and they just aren't popping up and I'm getting frustrated because at this point, Oliver Q's 335 is looking like it's not gonna happen. This was bird 322 for me. And uh, at this rate, even Adam's 2005 record is not, doesn't look like it's gonna happen either. Um, so I messaged a couple more experienced birders and I said, I've got, I'm a teacher. I've got Christmas break coming up. If you were me, where would you go in these two weeks at the end of the end of the year? And they, you know, to a man, they all said, if it was November, I'd say go up to Whitefish Point and wait. But it's December and Nuevo is kind of center in the mitten, hang there and wait. And I waited and waited and waited and waited. And I'm sure Andrew was so frustrated having me around. Um, because I wasn't around by choice. I was around because there was no rare birds popping up. Finally, on December 29, got a rare bird report on the uh, WhatsApp line of, uh, of this guy, Northern Hawk Owl in uh, Eastern Chippewa County. So I grabbed the bag, grabbed the go bag and, and tore up there, got there just about dusk and looking around and I couldn't find the bird. So I got, a, got an inexpensive hotel, got back down to the site before daybreak. And as, uh, as dawn broke, this is, what, this is the site that I was greeted with. So I got a, a nice picture of um, species 323 for me for the year, the, the Northern Hawk Owl. And while I was standing there on this dirt road, looking at an owl, up drives this little Subaru with a lady in her beagle. And it was Marie Rust again, um, who I had seen so many times during the year. But uh, she pulled up and she and I stood together and we both recognized uh, this moment was pretty, pretty poignant that um, we started the year together 
on a cold dirt road looking at an owl and we ended the year the same way. Um, in my first presentation with uh, when I was at uh, in this Grand Haven with Beth's group, um, someone asked, well, what was your most favorite bird or the bird that was the most important? And I, I had a hard time with that because as long as I've talked this evening, there's a story for 323 species of birds. And I think they're all interesting stories, but this bird, um, the, the black cap chickadee I chose because this bird I was able to record on my list in all 83 counties. This species was the one I saw the most frequently. Um, this is a, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to, to admit this to you guys, but I saved Wayne County for the last not in my mind because I was saving the best for last, but I'm not a big fan of cities. And, uh, and I, Andrea has an uncle that lives in uh, Redford Township. So we decided um, we'll, we'll do Wayne's, Wayne County last. We stopped at Kensington on the way down, um, spent the night at uncle's and we actually spent the next day birding out at uh, Belle Isle and it was just beautiful. Um, very un-Detroitish, I think. Belle Isle is a beautiful place. Um, and, and this is our website. And I have reached the end of the year. And I appreciate you guys uh, being patient. I think I went a little long, which isn't particularly surprising, I guess. But I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for, for giving the talk. I mean, you're only about... 10 or 15 minutes beyond uh, what we were aiming for. So that's not a problem. I, I call um, that a victory. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah the, I call that ever... a victory. My wife would probably be surprised. <laughs> um, if you ever decide that you want to come back to Wayne when you're visiting family, we do have a birding hotspot website. Um, someone did comment earlier, oh. just as a, a note. Um, it's point Mouye. So moo and then yay. Moo yay. Moo yay. Yeah. Moo or yay. Thank you. I, I, I said it <laughs> wrong every place. The people on the west side don't correct me because they don't know as well as you guys. I knew that. I was a little intimidated talking to the southeast group. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. You're moo fine. Yay. Moo yay. Or yay. if you're ever unsure, just say point <laughs> moo. Everyone says point moo here. What moo? Point moo. Yep. Yeah, not, not, not in love with that place. <laughs> just as a heads up if you ever decide to go back you can put in a request to drive it but you have to get a permit that's a thing yeah, yeah. we we oh. leave two driving field trips uh, a year there <laughs> okay all right yeah i did see photos from one of your field trips where someone had gotten um king rail and I didn't get, I did not get the point Moo King Rail. <laughs> um, Chris put, uh, how wonderful I felt like I was out there with you. Black Cap Chickadees, my fave. Thank you so much. Uh, another person put, that was inspiring. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, for everyone else, if you're ever up in Michigan, again, we offer field trips all the time. You can check out our hotspot page. Um, there are so many wonderful places. Kensington's amazing. Belle Isle's amazing. We frequently lead field trips at Elmwood Cemetery, um, which is an arboretum, certified arb arboretum, which is also a really awesome opportunity, um, among many other places. But besides that, uh, I do see some more comments. Someone said, I'm sorry, so sorry you had to go through COVID. Hope to see you on the trail one day. And then <laughs> someone put, how many miles did you drive looking for birds? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I, I, was, I was afraid to talk to Andrea about this because, you know, I recorded the mileage and because we have a birding business and we do sell field guides and things like that on our website, um, I use this is a as a business deduction and it came to somewhere between 33,000 and 34,000 miles just bopping around Michigan <laughs> woof yeah I mean your poor car <laughs> yep yeah yeah 
Um, although I was talking to, maybe some of you know um, Daryl Bernard from the Seven Ponds um, Nature Center in Lapeer County. His son, Danny, did a big, big year in 2022. And uh, he was, he, most of the miles he said were on his dad's car, but they put close to 40,000 miles on. And Danny Bernard this year, or I'm sorry, in 2022, actually broke the Michigan big year record. He, uh, he scored 300, 337 species. So he broke, at, broke uh, Oliver Q's 2020 record um, last year. Oh, wow. We actually have a comment. It's kind of exciting. Uh, Allison put great talk and really enjoyed the pictures. Many thanks from Southwest Scotland. Oh, oh Scotland is on my bucket list. Bird. <laughs> wow. I'll yeah. Keep, a, keep an eye on that name and then uh, look Allison up when I'm in Scotland. Huh? That's cool. <laughs> and I want to invite you to come over to the west side of up by Muskegon to Bird and you uh, um, look me up on our website and uh, and I'd love to take you out. I'm retired now. I retired the year after I did the big year, which I can't explain. Um, I, yeah, um, I'm kind of impulsive. Yeah, yeah. I was actually uh, going to say if you were interested or anyone else on the webinar is um, we actually last year we offered our first partner program with uh, in Traverse City. We did a birds, bikes and wines oh. bike tour along the Lelano Peninsula. And so if you wanna jump on up uh, next fall, we're gonna be doing it in September again. And uh, it's super fun. We bike along the Lelano Trail. We stop at places, go birding. We drink yeah, some wine, you know, fun. it's a fun day. Um, Lori put, so do you want to- Updates on that from your website. Huh? Yeah. So Lori put, do you want <laughs> to attempt another big year? You know, at the- it was so strange at the at, at once New Year hit 2022. It was uh, it was as much as I love birding. It was such a relief to not be married to the rare bird report, and uh, and I, I I only I think I only chased four rare birds this year, um, but just in the past few weeks I've been thinking, boy, I kind of missed that that adrenaline rush. And I, talk, I talked to Andrea about that before. I said, you know, maybe in a few years, um, you know, after I got my feet under me as far as in retirement and I have, you know, as long as the health holds out, I think I would like to do another one someday. Um, but uh, yeah, this year um, I missed a lot of rare birds because I was just exhausted from running. Where did you get your rare bird reports from? I'm, I'm looking at the chats along with you now. Oh, um, the, the, originally, the rare bird report was, uh, if you go on, on uh, eBird, you can subscribe to rare bird reports, and they'll update them hourly and send you an email hourly um, for, um, I, I had mine set up so I could get rare bird reports for the whole state, but you can set it up so it's just from your county or several counties. Um, but what I found was more valuable as the year went on was uh, another social media um, outlet called WhatsApp. And on WhatsApp, um, there would be rare bird chasers discussing where the bird was seen last and the, you know real time discussion. Um, and, and the rare bird community got too big for a WhatsApp account. So now it's on Discord, but uh, it was all, all online and uh, Discord sounds like a bad thing. And, but in this case, it's a, it's a group um, conversation app that, uh, um, you know, get real time information from people who are staked out there at the, at the bird and watching it. Awesome. I thought about that several times when I considered Adam Burns 2000 record or 2005 record before the, you know apps were a thing. Um, he re, I, I imagine it was a lot like emails and um, telephone calls and things like that. Yeah, that certainly is one maybe one of these days did you ever get around to maybe calling him or emailing him just to see like what that was like for him in comparison 
No, I, I intend to, um, because I do have a, a, a podcast that, that I haven't updated lately on our website that I'd like to interview him and uh, and also Danny Bernard on his new the new record. I uh, I talked to Adam a couple of times on the beach on the shore of uh, Lake Superior, but we I was too much in awe. I uh, it's it was humbling to realize how much I didn't know about birds standing by the people at Whitefish Point, um, Sky Haas and. Uh, and Adam Byrne and several other people that uh, they live and breathe birds and they're, they're pointing out really, really fine plumage points on these birds that are flying by at a distance that I, I'm looking through my scope and can barely make out the bird and they're identifying traits that uh, it's just a whole different league. Oh no, I, I can relate to that. We had a, a, bir a winter birding walk recently and it was interesting one of the attendees who was the husband of one of the co-leads has a PhD um, in ornithology and he pointed out that we um, one of the these birds we were seeing and every single person there was just like wait that blurry blob is is that bird what and he was like well you could tell yeah. based on this and this and everyone was just like my eyes are bad it's like no no it's it's the experience showing right there. <laughs> oh, but it Although was. I think there's something to be said about the quality of the optics, too. I found out that uh, I'm, I'm looking at the same bird that they are, and I can't pick out the points on my scope. You know, I look over there and they have a Swarovski scope, then they can, they can, the, the definition is, or the resolution is that much better, I think. But, yeah. so, but either way, uh, so as a, Goodbye. So uh, thank you everybody so much for joining us today. Uh, we will be offering another webinar in February. Our continued webinar is going to be the how to start birding part three. So we're going to be talking about pointers on how to ID birds beyond just giving you a list of birds. We're going to talk about what you should look for, what details you might want to look at when you're IDing these birds, maybe that you don't know um, on top of certain places that you can find them, not necessarily just telling you hot spots, but where you can look that might be good areas for them. And so uh, we hope you can join us. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for, for coming to Terry's talk today. And uh, thank you, Terry, for coming and presenting. So thanks, Terry. That was lots of fun. Thank you. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Good night. All right. I will I'll have to let you know when I'm going to be down there visiting uncle again, and maybe somebody, somebody will take me out birding. <laughs> Sounds Camp good. Audubon. I belong to Camp Audubon. Check it out. <laughs> okay. Sure will. All right. Have a good, good evening, guys. Good night, all. Good birding.